Um, that's enough for me on that. I, I would ask David Nassiter, I've asked David to talk on perhaps some of the social issues. David, David, uh, I met, uh, I lived on Russell Street in Berkeley when I was, oh, I think 15. He lived a block up the street. He was a graduate student at Cal then and quickly got involved with our very small bicycle club. And though David doesn't lay any claims to be winners of any big races, he has ridden his bicycle consistently since those years and still does ride much more than most of us here do today. Um, David? Thank you, Peter. Uh, I really want to thank Peter for organizing and putting this on. I don't think that there are many who would be as qualified as he uh, for doing this. And I think we all, the whole cycling community owes him a great debt in many ways. And although Peter asked me uh, to speak about the origins of my interests in the cycling sport, as someone who grew up in the Chicago area, I was too young, too isolated, and too weird to have been uh, involved with any of the organized cycling activities in that region at that time. And it would be presumptuous beyond all expression for me to attempt to regale you with uh, the world of cycling activities as it was known then. But let me recall to you for a moment, or at least, yeah, I think looking around, maybe I can also actually recall uh, something about life at that time in the United States in the 1940s, uh, when uh, the population of the United States, the total population of the United States was 132 million. Um, California had fewer than 7 million residents in 1940, uh, and it's about the same as the Bay Area population of today. So when you say, Peter, and I certainly believe you, that uh, encountering another cyclist uh, was a rare event, uh, yeah, there just were not that many people doing anything uh, at that time. And uh, while uh, cycling has grown uh, and become more acceptable, I have to say, although it's outside the time frame, uh, when I was uh, living briefly in Washington, D.C. in the 70s. Uh, people were still trying to run me off the road and yelling at me uh, that it was improper for an adult white, adult male, uh, to be engaged in such frivolous activity as riding a bicycle during the working hours of the week. Uh, it was simply uh, a kind of deviance they were not pleased to uh, tolerate. Um, in any event, uh, there are, of course, a lot of other people who have uh, done a much better job than I'll be able to do of trying to set the scene of what was happening or what the con social context was at the time of uh, what Peter has identified as the rebirth of cycling in the States uh, after its untimely death uh, with the introduction, pretty much, of the automobile around the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, <clears throat> that did have a profoundly negative, uh, and, I, and I should say that a lot of what I have to say here draws heavily upon the work of uh, someone you may know named Ken Kiefer. Uh, in any event, uh, he notes that, uh, as many other historians do, that while the introduction of the automobile at the beginning of the 20th century did have a profoundly negative effect on the use of the bicycle by adults, uh, that the rise in the interest of cycling in the post-World War II era uh, really comes from some very broad changes in American life, not necessarily uh, the, the actions of an individual or the occurrence of a single event, that there were some sweeping changes going on. Uh, and. Uh, so I, I, I think everybody here who's there looking around, no offense meant, everybody here can probably remember uh, some of these times. Um, and it's no offense to be old enough to remember them. Um, so that certainly World War II removed the possibility of uh, large commercial sporting events such as the World Series, at which point I must say go Giants. Um, not to mention smaller events uh, such as uh, six-day racing to which Peter has referred. Uh, 
But what the uh, Second World War did, of course, in the United States was to reemphasize the utility of cycling, um, especially as gasoline rationing uh, hit home. And um, I should say a, another source in this, someone you know, uh, I, many of you know, uh, cycling as a, uh, John Forrester in his interesting piece on American cycling history in the 1940s uh, talks about the growth of non-competitive cycling as a worthwhile activity. Uh, and there are references that he makes not just to the Berkeley and San Francisco cycling clubs of the 40s, uh, which were engaged in competitive events, but he refers to local cyclists that he knew, Peter being one of them, and Jobst Brandt, I didn't see him, but I suspect he's probably here in spirit, if not physically, um, was engaged at that time in what became kind of a prototype for the, uh, the, the recreational tour, if you will, of uh, great length and considerable difficulty as he rode around through the uh, Sierra Nevada and began to report about it. Um, during the 50s, uh, with the Cold War in full swing and veterans struggling to achieve the American dream, support for the dominant lifestyle, uh, sport, style of recreation, uh, was very strong. And all kinds of, or any kind of perceived deviance, whether it was political or, or uh, sartorial, or recreational or any other kind was not tolerated uh, very well, even in uh, the uh, extraordinary place that is Berkeley, which some of you do know, a very tolerant place. Even there, it was not well tolerated. And um, I re uh, remember uh, Peter asked us not to uh, get into personal anecdotes too much. But I do remember that as someone who was picketing the House Un-American Activities Committee in San Francisco, I was wearing a coat and tie at the time that uh, I may have been a little bit deviant in my politics, but certainly not sufficiently deviant uh, to offend people by weird and bizarre dress. That was to come in the 60s when I started doing that. Um, so the intolerance for deviance from the norms of the, the pre-World War II and, and even through World War II uh, was uh, most painfully evident, of course, in the unwillingness of those in power uh, to extend um, uh, voting rights to minorities, and uh, particularly to blacks who were expected to be, as Ralph Ellison characterized it, uh, invisible men. Um, but and I say this simply to suggest that in the context of the period of time that Peter's asked us to speak about, 45 to 60, there, the beginnings were certainly a period of great conformity in American life, uh, great pressures uh, to do things as they had been. And of course, people were starting up. The, the, the economy had uh, started up again after the war, supported by the war. It was possible to do things like get married for the first time. Uh, and um, to uh, get a house and begin to get involved in things other than the frivolous activities of, uh, of cycling. Uh, it was Ernie, I guess, who was uh, chastised for his frivolity. Is that right? Was that who? Ernie. Uh, w weren't you uh, chastised for being frivolous in your interest in cycling? Pardon? You can't hear me. You're lucky. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, um, it, it was a time of great uh, uh, conformity. And, uh, but there were some major social streams, or, or, or I should say strains, developing in this uh, superficially homogeneous world of conformity. And uh, so, Along with the early evidence in the in the beginning in the 60s uh, of um, conflicting lifestyles, uh, I know we're supposed to stop in 1960, but the early tremors of some tectonic shifts in American life could be detected 
uh, in the, even in the 50s, uh, the rise of feminism, the anti-war movement, uh, once the Vietnam War got going, all these things were happening. And there were some compelling rationales for social and institutional change. So social institutions, as fundamental as the family, thinking back to the um, communes of the, of some of the, a little bit later in that time, the family was becoming redefined, gender was being re redefined uh, as a socially constructed phenomenon, uh, and essential elements of the value system uh, were under strong pressure uh, to change. And conformity itself, which had been so highly valued previously, and nonconformity so strongly disparaged, uh, was uh, now uh, becoming disparaged. So to, to be square and to be middle class became insulting terms in some circles. Linda Ronstadt uh, was singing, and the Stone Ponies were singing about marching to the sound of a different drum. And marching to the sound of a different drum became a virtue at that time in ways that it had never been before. Now the number of cyclists continued to increase along with the population. And so did the proportion of cyclists uh, who were female and uh, uh, in other ways um, trying to put together the idea that traditions were being changed. Uh, but even 10 years after World War II, uh, riding on a track was confined to a relatively small number of years, or certainly smaller number of locations than prior to, the, uh, to World War II and infrastructure matters. Uh, s and uh, Peter uh, has not given up, I think, on what has been a continuing tilting at windmills uh, as over the years he has tried to bring a track uh, to this, well, not to this area, but to the Bay Area. Uh, I recall early Berkeley Wheelman uh, before Velosport, Velo Orange, defected and split off uh, uh, talks of a, of a velodrome uh, coming into the East Bay. Uh, but it didn't happen. Um, still, most of the bikes being sold, as Peter, I'm sure, could tell us, uh, and uh, uh, Ted, were bikes for children. And the Bicycle Owner's Complete Handbook, which was published in 1960, uh, at that time, there were 3.7 million bicycles sold in the U.S. and 55 million that had been sold from 33 to 59, which had included the Depression and the war. And the point of that is bicycles were being sold. People were riding bicycles, but it was being defined as a, uh, a, a, an activity for children. Still, in 1961, uh, Peter uh, mimeographed the first eight-page edition of the VeloSport newsletter. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, this was an indication that indeed, somewhere in the counterculture, and I do lump the cyclists into the counterculture by that time, although they had been the mainstream of American sports culture uh, at the turn of the 20th century, they were now very much a counterculture activity. Uh, and Peter uh, was among the stalwarts who were uh, beginning to provide s identification and communication among uh, the people of that world. Okay, uh, in 1940, going back for a moment, there were about 8 million unemployed in the uh, United States. By 1950, it was 151 million. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong about that. That was the population. Uh, by 1950, the number was, had dropped from 8 million to about 3 million. Uh, the national debt was about 43 billion. We used to speak in, you know, if you go back further, far enough, I think it was Everett Dirksen who was talking about a million here, a million there, so pretty soon you have some real money. Now it's a trillion here, a trillion there. Anyway, the minimum wage uh, in the 40s was about 43 cents an hour. A uh, teacher's salary like that of my mother was uh, $1,400 a year on the average when it was paid, although I do recall my mother uh, receiving part of her pay from the Chicago Public Schools in Scrip uh, because they didn't have enough cash. Uh, 
uh, to pay. Um, so times were a little different in the immediate post-war <coughs> years. Oh yeah, and the, uh, by 1950, the annual salary had risen to about almost $3,000, and the price of a loaf of bread was, does anybody recall? We all think in terms of gasoline, but so 14 cents. Yeah, 14 cents was the average price. Um, only 55% of the homes in the United States had indoor plumbing in 1940. Uh, the life expectancy for a male in 1940 was about 68 years and about 61 years for a female. Um, and on and on. So uh, I wanted to get to the point that in 1940, uh, there was no, uh, Peter referred to the fact that he had to scour the newspapers with in, in the 50s uh, with no success for any reference to cycling activities of any kind or cycle sport in particular. It, it just wasn't there. Um, the only thing, another thing that wasn't there in at that period of time, uh, the the only national system of communication at that time, besides the newsreel, remember the March of Time, uh, was the um, radio, which tended to cover local events uh, and not national events. There was no national television uh, in uh, 1950; uh, it had not yet come into being. Uh, so covering coverage of sporting events as a recruiter or as an acknowledger of uh, cycle activities as being something that people did um, just were confined very locally. So Peter's mimeographed uh, cycling uh, uh, double sport news um, was a, an, important, um, uh, an important example of what could be done. Um, anyway, California, so Life was going on, and as Ernie pointed out, life was going on in the East. Uh, life was going on in Chicago. Cycling life was going on perhaps in, in Chicago, uh, maybe with a little pseudopod up into Wisconsin, uh, and some in California, but there was no real way of knowing about the national cycling s scene at all. Uh, there was no real um, journal about that. So. Uh, in trying to understand how people, individuals might have gotten involved in cycling, like other people my age, uh, I was born uh, in 1934, and like other kids my age around the time of the war, uh, I did have a bicycle. Uh, I was employed. Uh, we didn't have a car, uh, but I was employed uh, delivering newspapers, which taught me the early elements of uh, bicycle handling, especially with a full load of papers on a snowy, icy day. Uh, there was, it was not an easy task uh, to do that, to ride around and throw those things out. Uh, but in 1948, uh, I, one of my cousins returned from France, and he brought with him the most remarkable bicycle I'd ever seen uh, with narrow tires and multiple speeds. And uh, it took me a decade to get a bicycle anything like that. And even then, it was a three-speed uh, with a Sturmey Archer hub as being sort of the ultimate uh, event. That put me into a very special class of folks who had exotic machinery at their, at their uh, beck and call. That there were not many people, there were not, no other people where I lived who had, that I was aware of, that had that kind of exotic machinery and who were then able to do things uh, that ordinary kids my age couldn't do. Um, I, uh, I had had, I, I was born with some problems with my feet. Walking was then and continues to be a difficult task for me. But cycling was another story and it was a really liberating event. And so suddenly I was beginning to, be, sorry about the personal recollections, but uh, I was beginning to be able to realize that I had the, mo the mobility, if no car, uh, almost the mobility of a car. I could cover great, great distances, uh, explore new things and new areas. And, um, uh, and so anyway, I went off to uh, school and someplace else. And until my bicycle was stolen, that was my major means of transport and recreation. Uh, eventually, other things entered my life. Uh, 
Uh, I married my high school sweetheart in 1955, and so we've been together for 56 years now. Um, and one of the th smartest things we ever did was to move out of that area and out to California, where I met, or we met, um, in 1955, uh, a very curious young man uh, who began to reveal to us things about cycling we never could have imagined. And his name was John Scott, a figure in the development of uh, cycling, certainly in the Davis area, but uh, in a lot of areas. He brought uh, to the world of cycling uh, a whole form of recreational, John did race, but uh, a whole form of recreational cycling uh, that has exploded in many directions. And while lots of people rightfully, well, lot, lots of people claim, uh, to be the originator of the mountain bike. Uh, John certainly was in there as one of the early founders and contributors to this uh, invention which has shaped uh, cycling in its later years. Anyway, um, what was happening and continues to happen that, um, uh, well, John mentioned to me, or I'm sorry, I, I met Peter uh, about that time. Uh, this is beginning to get toward the end of uh, his period to be covered. And he mentioned that I might find some kindred uh, spirits early on weekend mornings, mornings gathered at Sather Gate, uh, which used to, uh, if you recall, be the end of Telegraph Avenue. Telegraph Avenue went all the way up to the campus at that time. And uh, indeed, I fell in with uh, a bunch of uh, people who uh, began to shape my image of myself as a competitive cyclist. I knew that I was destined uh, for the role of uh, the permanent Lantern Rouge, that my role in uh, the cycling world was to uh, make it, to keep, allow s clubs to grow because I was the one that everyone could beat. So naturally there was no <laughs> need to drop out. So uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's my contribution uh, in there at all. Uh, so I, I th I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, I, some of the elements of the Renaissance that we see now in, in Northern California really owes uh, or, or can be attributed uh, to the social movements of the 60s and the 70s, which broke down a lot of traditional barriers, which opened up uh, new opportunities uh, and the experience of the delights of cycling uh, and in all its forms to many more people. and. Uh, a particularly noteworthy factor in all of this um, was played by Peter. But I want to get, uh, I, I do want to incorporate one comment that um, uh, Ted and I exchanged a moment ago. We crossed paths <coughs> earlier on in our lives, and perhaps he'll talk about that. Uh, how qualitatively the experience of uh, the cycling has changed from the time when we were a small group of deviants uh, to who enjoyed one another's company in the act of cycling, uh, how things have been transformed, and I think we would agree, uh, not for the better, into a world of uh, people who see uh, commercial life as a professional uh, uh, activity as their major motivator uh, in life. So uh, let's hear it, so to speak, for the 40s and the 50s in the sense that uh, they were the good old days. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> Just to remind me of a few reference points, the economy of America uh, suddenly became very, very strong after the war, basically 47 on, uh, full employment, um, but also use this one. <clears throat> there was a strong desire on the part of most Americans to, to appear well-off, prosperous, modern American. And again, that excluded bicycles. You didn't want to have any reflection on perhaps the poverty that your uh, immigrant family experienced years ago. You wanted to say, I am an American. I do not ride a bicycle. 
one little anecdote. I reserve the right to take some anecdotes myself. Um, one, one day, um, perhaps it was 1956, another friend of mine and I were riding our bicycles through San Mateo County, and a uh, sheriff, uh, deputy sheriff, pulled us over and arrested us. It was very unclear why he was arresting us. Turned out he simply didn't like the fact that bicycles were on the roads. And he gave us a lecture about how uh, roads were for automobiles. I was held over. Um, I was still a minor. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I was held over to Monday morning to a, uh, and a judge looked at the arrest report then he looked at the officers. He said, officer, can't believe this. Next time you arrest somebody, make sure they violated a law. I mean, but it was, it was simply his image that it was un-American for somebody to be on public roads on a bicycle. Um, one little bizarre indication of prosperity. I remember driving uh, with my father then, uh, maybe 1947, people were talking about televisions and we went down middle class streets in Richmond. We saw lots of antennas on lots of houses. But come to know those people, they didn't have a television. They just had an antenna. It, it made them look well off. Um, uh, David mentioned doing his newspaper route. In 1949, I think it was, I spotted a Schwinn Black Phantom in a Schwinn dealer. And I think the price was $90. And I conned my mother into coming up with the third, and my grandmother with the third, and I came up with the third. And I bought this unbelievably elegant bicycle. It was the most elegant bicycle I'd ever seen. It had chrome fenders, and it had a brake light, and it had a broad leather saddle, and it had a spring fork, and it had a tank with a horn in it, and a, and a brake light. I mean, it was a white wall tires. It was so cool. And I did my paper route on that. I had two paper routes, morning and an evening route. Um, that was probably my introduction to learning how to get strong on a bicycle. Because, yeah, we carried 100 pounds of newspapers on the handlebars in those bikes. Um, John Finley Scott was mentioned. I mean, he, he was sort of outside the picture of racing, but quite a character. He had a bicycle that I think was a Flying Scott brand frame that he called his Woody, and it had 650B tires on it and extreme uh, Cyclobenelux gear range. And I remember being in his apartment once, his incredible collection of maps, and he proudly, uh, you know, marked magic marker on all the roads he had been on. He was also a railroad buff. But there was a booklet in his uh, house uh, that was um, uh, called, um, I can't think what it was called, back, um, it was an international cycle touring organization. And he used to once a year or so go to uh, <laughs> the Burma Trail or railroads in the Scotland highlands and just ride these roads that weren't really roads, just trails. So one could argue that he was perhaps the first or certainly one of the first mountain bike riders. Um, also, there was considerable crossover between tourists and racers. It, it wasn't that well defined. Um, if you had a derailleur bike, it was pretty likely that you could call yourself a bike racer because people would look at it and say, well, that's a racing bike. And you would say yes. and, and and uh, there, there are very few people in the early 40s who actually did ride races. There are a lot of tourists who would drop in on races once in a while, and you saw a great variety of Rue Goldberg kind of activity. And those were the years where, you know, virtually all racing had been on fixed gear bikes. Even even races with significant hills were all done in fixed gear bikes. I would like George Koenig to step to the mic, please, and. Um, tell us about what it was like for him growing up in the Palo Alto area and then onward to Olympic uh, trials. All right, I guess this is going to be all anecdotal. That's fine. Um, in, uh, I grew up in Palo Alto. I was born in 1935, and I grew up in Palo Alto during the war. And uh, I remember this as a, a wonderful time for all the kids in town to ride their bikes. They were all single speed with a coaster brake. And we would turn the handlebars upside down so they looked like horns. And uh, I actually uh, have a vivid memory. Uh, I'm a couple years younger than Yopes. I have a vivid memory of him hunt hunting us up onto the sidewalk on uh, a street there. 
kind of uh, bullying the younger kids, but we were all on bikes <laughs> and uh, we enjoyed uh, riding around town a lot and uh, having a, a bike was really everything. And uh, we would, uh, an adventure was to go out to the Stanford campus to cross the El Camino Real and ride around the Frost Amphitheater out there and make trouble for the gardeners. So uh, I, I always had this love of bike. Getting a bike was the, the greatest thing in the world. And uh, then I was sent away to boarding school and uh, for four years in high school. And um, I remember taking one bike ride down there uh, in Southern California uh, towards Ontario. But uh, I came back to Stanford and then I already had a car. And um, so I, uh, it, it was the furthest thing in my mind to you know, ride a bicycle anymore. And then I saw an old four-speed, or not a old, I guess, four-speed French bike, uh, Automoto. Uh, this would be 1955 in uh, the bike shop at Stanford. Uh, and there was just a little hole in the wall by the fire station and had wing nuts and a four-speed derailleur. And I bought that thing and started racing around Palo Alto and just thinking that was the greatest. And that summer, uh, I um, made a trip to Europe with a fraternity friend of mine. And he was a little bit older and had graduated. And uh, we went to Paris and uh, looked around for bicycles to buy to ride on this trip that we had in mind. And um, I'd never had a contact with any other bike rider in America. And um, we saw these beautiful bikes on the Boulevard Grande Armée, which is the extension of the Champs Elysees on the other side of the Arc de Triomphe in a shop, I think it was Oscar Egg's shop. And these were bikes that you would ride in the Tour de France, and they were incredibly expensive. And that was what I wanted, but that wasn't what we got. We ended up with these 10-speed uh, bikes with fenders and a light and pannier bags and a rack. And we rode them north through France uh, into Belgium and Holland across into Germany and south across the Alps and Austria and all the way to Rome. And uh, when we got to Rome, I saw a bike shop um, near the America Can Express where they had these uh, Italian bikes that looked just better than the French bikes because they had Campagnola derailleurs. And uh, I went right into this bike shop and we each bought one of these bikes brand new. And it was uh, um, painted gold and had chrome lugs and aluminum bars and aluminum stem and, and um, a Campagnolo record. And I think it cost about 95 bucks. And I took them right to the American Express and had them boxed up and sent back to California. And uh, then we continued with this trip a little bit and ended up, they were called a Lazaretti. And um, so here I was back in California with this bike that excited me almost more than anything that you can imagine. And, um, but I was all alone with this me and my bicycle. And uh, I would ride uh, still because I got in pretty good shape that summer on this long trip. And out in Woodside one day in the fall, uh, somebody came down the other way from on Cañada Road, and it was Ricky Bronson. And uh, we circled and introduced ourselves to each other. And uh, Ricky was riding in his California championship jersey, his bear flag jersey, and uh, cut a very elegant figure on a bike even then. So Ricky introduced me then to... Uh, the racing community in San Francisco, which included Bobby and Billy Best and Steve Pfeiffer and um, Eric Neff and uh, Dave Staub. And uh, then I rode some, uh, uh, Charlie Allert had taken up residence in Palo Alto. And so I got to meet Charlie and join the ABA 
And uh, Ricky and I started writing a lot together. I would leave Los Altos and he would leave Belmont and we would meet in, uh, in Woodside and then it was always a question of where the hell to go, um, <laughs> towards his place or towards my place. And um, so I rode a few races and, um, and we went to Los Angeles and rode a race and that's where the first time I had to be beaten by Bob Tetzloff. <laughs> 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 he probably remembers. <laughs> and um, I made it to the end with him and uh, uh, then I suddenly found out what a sprint was. And uh, then we, uh, Ricky insisted that we go back to Europe. And so I sold my car and um, I w had been introduced then to Spence Wolf, who had a little bike shop in his uh, garage in Cupertino, mostly to tune up his son's wheels, who was knew the Gattos and raced in San Jose. And um, Spence had a Chinelli hanging in his shop with that was gunmetal gray and no one bought it because it was the ugliest thing you've ever seen and uh, looked like you know a navy issue bike but uh, so it hung there for the better part of that year and then Spence wrote Gino Cinelli that we were coming to Europe so Rick and I uh, Rick arranged all the the uh, transportation and we went across the Atlantic on a Greek liner and uh, got to Le Havre and met up with two other young fellows that he knew, one named Hartman and other than Herman, and they were on track bikes. And they rode all the way from Le Havre to Milan on track bikes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, this is one other incident I want to relate here since uh, I'm sitting next to Mr. Becker here. Uh, we met at Ted Kirkbride's one time and before we went to Europe and Harry showed up in his USA sweatshirt and uh, you don't remember <laughs> and I looked at that and I thought I want one of those <laughs> <laughs> so that was like a huge motivator for me so Rick said you know we got to go to Europe we got to tra train that's the only place they ride you know hard enough and and um, so Chino, when we got there, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to the Cinelli factory, but it was, uh, uh, it was just a metal shop and on and north of Milan uh, on a little industrial road without any trees. And it was a yellow uh, stucco industrial building. And uh, across a gravel parking lot was uh, the office where Mrs. Cinelli uh, held forth. And there was a big picture of uh, Chino winning the world championship on the wall and the sprint where he won the world championship. And he was just a really great guy. And they went all out for us to make us feel good. And of course, it was all happening in Italian, which wasn't our language. And they, uh, they got us licenses. Chino got us licenses to be able to participate in races in Italy. And uh, Ricky and I, were different age groups, but we were able to r ride one ri race together in Rome. I'm not quite sure why. And actually, we were we were pretty competitive. And uh, it wound around behind Rome and uh, went up to a town pretty high up in the hills. And it was a hell of a climb. And we arrived there about fifth and sixth, about uh, 30 seconds back. And then they stopped the race and there was a kind of a rest period and then they turned it around and they made sure since it was Italy that we didn't get to start at the in the order that we came up <laughs> so we were we started somewhere way back in the pack and then basically blasted through all those people and you know got out there and I think he and I finished alone somewhere out there uh, dropped what was behind us and never caught what was in front of us but we, we uh, like, they it made it into the newspaper in Rome and it sort of said the Americans looked competitive. And then I rode another serious race, which I'd like to tell you about, in, uh, was the Gran Primo of Lombardy. And um, 
I mean, re realized that I'd never really raced very much in America. Uh, and so here I was suddenly riding from Monzo, where they had put us up uh, in a funny little hotel. And um, I rode with the Italians that were going to ride this race down to Milan, which was 20 miles away or, you know, 20 kilometers at least. And then we got to into Milan and got into this race with this mob, and there must have been 350 Italian ra racers that were going to compete in this thing. And I just rode in this mob through Milan, through all these uh, disastrous residential areas, and finally got to the outside of Milan in this mob of riders, and the front of the race was somewhere up there. I never even saw it. And all of a sudden, I was in a line of about 20 riders uh, going as fast as I'd ever gone in my life. And uh, in my biggest gear, spun out. And uh, I just kept my head down and stayed in this line for, uh, I don't know, 20 miles. And uh, we went through Gorgonzola, which you've all heard of since, and uh, headed up to Bergamo. And... Um, Somewhere uh, after Bergamo was like full of these giant cobblestones, and uh, I rattled through the streets in there with the still with some other people, and um, eventually I completely ran out of water and food, and uh, like uh, you know, 85 miles into it, got completely shaken off by everyone, and ended up finishing in the sag wagon, and uh, but it was. In, in, in all of my bicycling career, it was probably the only time I was really in a real race uh, where guys were going for broke right from the beginning and going as hard as they could. And, uh, and it was the only time I've ever really had to spin out my highest gear to stay on someone's wheel. And uh, anyway, so we came back and I rode the 56 trials in San Francisco and uh, watched Van Meter and Dodd ride away from me at the end of the race. Uh, and um, then, uh, then I, after that, I realized both of them had, were in the Army, and I realized the only way I was ever going to be com really competitive if I wanted to do this was to be in the Army. And uh, so I got let myself get drafted in 1958, and uh, Bob and Steve and Jack Hartman and uh, I were all trained together for two years in a row. And I finally just decided that if I could stay on Bob Tetzloff's wheel, I was going to make the team. <laughs> and uh, so I put my head down and stayed there for two years. And... Uh, uh, we went up after the Pan Am trials. The, you made the team, didn't you, Bob? And uh, I was like fifth again. And um, we went up to the Tour of St. Lawrence, and I think it was the first international race in which our, our competition really showed that we had some potential. Uh, Mike Hiltner won the race. Bob was second or third or something, and uh, eight or ninth. Eight or ninth. <laughs> I was I was fourth or fifth or something, and that was the only race I ever won was a stage of it, and I was in third for a while overall. It was a hell of a race. It was ten days. I rode Peter Rich's bike in one stage, <laughs> and uh, when I flatted out, and uh, we were all up there together. And we did really well. We won the team race, uh, and Michael won the race, and uh, and we were all very, very fit. And uh, at the at really the first time that we were, I think, internationally competitive. Well, can you tell me which way? We were slept sideways in a double bed. <laughs> Three. <laughs> And it was like 10 miles we had to ride after the race to get to a place where there was a bed. It was, it was, it was tough. Anyway, uh, 
<laughs> uh, the next year, uh, the Army released us in a timely fashion, and we all came to Oakland Army Terminal and, uh, and uh, rode races in California, and I just tried to stay on Bob's wheel. And uh, <laughs> then we went east in, uh, in about uh, end of June, I, or middle, beginning of June, I think, and were assigned to Governor's Island in New York. And uh, I often think that the only reason I did well in the Olympic trials, and uh, because I was never really a great athlete, I just had to train harder, was that um, I had a pretty good circumstance to be comfortable and feel healthy in on the East Coast and uh, living with some friends and being able to train up in near Woodstock, New York. And so then uh, the Olympic trials was a pretty good race uh, around Central Park. I think it was the first time they'd ever closed Central Park and uh, Mayor Lindsay wanted to close the park so they used the race for that. Uh, and uh, somewhere in the race uh, toward the end of it, Dodd broke away and I went, I am not going to let him win again <laughs> because uh, I, that was just too much. So although I was very unaggressive bike rider, I chased him down and caught him and uh, we were, we had like 20 seconds and uh, you know, 20 miles to go and uh, I couldn't get him to work. And uh, I soon found out why, because he was totally exhausted. He'd ridden a time trial the day before. And uh, so I was out there for a while, and all of a sudden Bob was with me, and Nick Van Mayle caught up, and uh, there were about, finally about 10 guys caught us. And I thought we were away from something, but evidently the race disintegrated behind us, chasing us. And uh, we went as hard as we could all the way to the finish. And it was an uphill sprint, which was good for me. And I placed fourth and made the team and got my, my uh, sweatshirt like Harry. <laughs> 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 so there were, you know, there was, it was great to meet the Cinellis. And Cin uh, Chino Cinelli took us to dinner uh, in uh, Rome when we came down there. Oh, I wanted, I wanted to tell you this. I put my Lazaretti in a ditch in France riding down to Milan. So Chino, like, took the opportunity to put me on a Cinelli in when I got to, uh, got to Milan. So I returned, uh, with a Cinelli bike and, um, and, uh, you know, I think to some extent helped establish his brand what uh, what I my situation was really I was on the transition from track bikes to road bikes and uh, I loved road bikes I still have a as nice a bike as you can possibly imagine and I still ride a couple times a week and uh, enjoy the hell out of it and um, I was always much more of a rider than a racer and uh, so I, uh, I was, th if there was anything that uh, I played in this uh, counterculture role, it was to, uh, you know, to have the one of the first road bikes. And road bikes were really important. That's really what it's all about, is that when these bikes finally got to America, uh, they became popular. And uh, when N Ricky and I came back in 1956, we started the Pedali Alpini. And um, the way we started it was I designed a jersey, took it down to Spence Wolf, gave him 120 bucks to put down on it. And he sent over to Italy for 12 jerseys. And gradually the guys showed up to buy them <laughs> from him. <laughs> so that was as organized as Pedali Alpini ever was. But it did become kind of a counterculture icon. So uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, George. Um, I, I, it, um, <laughs>
and I got there um, five years after that, and there still was considerable devastation from the war, bombed mm -hmm. out buildings and terrible roads, which uh, must have made an impression on you then. Um, uh, not long after that, I, I've had some conversations recently with other um, um, American bike riders who at one point had a, a great deal of promise of whom I asked, why did you not want to go to Europe? And they quite frankly said they just couldn't live in those destitute conditions, that they were just too comfortable in America to spend more than a few days in, in Europe with any one race. Um, uh, when I saw the film Breaking Away, I thought, that's plagiarism. That's what <laughs> George Koenig and Rick Bronson did. Now, I've been told there was somebody else from Indiana from whom some of that Dave Blaze may, may have had an impression as well. But uh, George and Rick, mostly Rick, walked around uh, somewhat theatrically, only able to speak Italian at times, and, and just trying to convince us that we all had to really study the ways of Bartoli and Copi. That's where <laughs> bike riding really lay. Um, I, I will say that Brunson, I had talked on the telephone, sorry, I can't be here, he's in Canada. Um, he paid George a compliment in that George, uh, um, interestingly, was the, in, in the road race trials, ended up being not on the team, but being the first alternate on the team, both in 56 and 60. The, on the first occasion, um, that was only his second season of racing bicycles, and that, that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, in those years, um, as I said earlier, there was very, very little to read. There was a magazine that came out of England, I think twice a month, called Cycling. As cycling diminished even then, they changed the name to Cycling and Mopeds because they had to have something else to write about. We all used to, um, there was a column, Reg Harris was the superstar on the track in those years. I think for seven or eight years, he was the best pro sprinter in the world. And he, he used to write a column, you know, three, two or three paragraphs only titled Reg Says. And we grabbed that and said, oh, what does Reg say this week? Um, and one of them that I, I just think about all the time, as he would say, um, never stand when you can sit and never sit when you can lie down. <laughs> um, I early in, in my narrative introduction, I, I did mention Peter Nye's book, um, Hearts of Lions, which to my knowledge is the best comprehensive um, piece of literature on, on the history of the sport. It was published in 88, I think, or 86 or 88. Um, and but big, the era of which we speak today was largely missing because it just wasn't possible to resource. Somebody mentioned Charlie Allert, who was uh, quite a contributor to bicycle racing in, in Northern California. Charlie, I don't know how much success Charlie had as a bike racer, but he had been a bike racer. I believe he was from New York. And he grew up in a, in a vaudeville, his parents were vaudeville actors. And uh, over the years I read various pieces of literature that said there was a considerable crossover between bicycle racers and bicycle stunt riders. Yeah, he did that. And others, I mean, do you have, uh, c can you support that uh, notion that vaudeville actors often were bicycle, had been bicycle racers at one point? I don't recall that. Okay. Uh, I, I know in, Euro in Europe they do have yeah. competitions for various, uh, they even play soccer, mm -hmm. uh, bicycles yeah. and so yeah. forth. Well, I remember being in Charlie's house and seeing a image of this uh, hoop that his parents were riding on hoop to hoop and his father had been a bicycle, bicycle racer before that. And then in 1961, I did some racing in variety of countries, uh, Copenhagen, uh, Odense, and Ordrup Bonn, and I stayed at a home that was owned by somebody named Kay Brask Anderson, who had been a top bicycle racer for 20 years, and after his racing days were over, he became a bicycle acrobat. I mean, there, there was a significant crossover that we, d we don't necessarily see today. 